Would you turn with me in your Bible to the book of Lamentations? The book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And the verses will be projected on the screen. Lamentations, chapter 3. We're reading from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is the word of God. Please be seated. I want to tag this text this morning how Jeremiah dealt with depression. How, de how Jeremiah dealt with depression. And so the question this morning is, what do you do when it feels like the weight of the world is pressing down on you? What, what do you do? How do you handle that when your life feels pressured beyond belief? And the God that you trust and serve seems to be absent from the equation. What do you do in life when you are depressed and discouraged for an extended period of time and God seems to be nowhere around? This text this morning is tailored to teach us something about how to deal with depression. And so we want to look at the life of this godly man, this prophet of God named Jeremiah, and see how he dealt with depression um, in his life. Now, I want you to know that this kind of dealing with depression is going to require more than what you have. You need help from God to deal with depression the way this text lifts up dealing with depression. Um, we need to remember Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, who had an issue in his life. We don't quite know what it was. He said it was a thorn in his flesh. And he characterized it as a messenger of Satan that buffeted him daily. So whatever it was, it was, it was depressing, it was discouraging. It was from outside of himself, and it had lasted for a long time. In that scenario, Paul said that he prayed three times that the Lord would take the thorn from his flesh. The number three indicating that he was consistent in his prayer and that his prayer was heard by God. But rather than liberating from that condition of depression, God allowed him to stay in it. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. So while you wait for God to move in your life, it's important for you to understand that the grace of God is at work in your life and that his grace is sufficient for you, that in your weakness, he is made strong. And the reason you are here today is because God's grace is at work in your life. So in dealing with depression, the way the prophet Jeremiah would have us to deal with depression, it is important to understand that you need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to pull it off the way Jeremiah pulls it off. This book of Lamentation is a series of dirges. It's a series of mourning songs, of funeral songs, of sad songs that were written by the prophet Jeremiah. The book is written against the backdrop of the Babylonian invasion and capture of the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah's job was to announce to the people that if you don't change your ways, if you don't turn from your sin, then God's judgment will come upon you. God executed his judgment, and now the prophet is in the middle of this depressing dilemma. And he's been there for a long time. 
The verses of this book, we read something about a national time of grief and mourning resulting from the severe suffering that has been endured by the people of God. But even in the midst of this suffering, God has a man to proclaim his word and to bring honor to his name. Lamentations is an extension of the prophet Jeremiah. And lamentation, as its name suggests, is lamenting. It is sorrowful songs. It is loud cries for the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants. It's many expressions of anguish and pain that comes from the heart of the prophet. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah is a unique figure. He's a unique character in the Old Testament, you know. He was called by God, and he didn't want to be called. And God told him before he went on his mission, your mission will be a failure. Nobody's going to listen to you. You are not going to win a single convert. But Jeremiah had to do what God called him to do. So whether you feel successful or whether you look for successful, what really must happen in our lives is we have to be obedient to God. Let me tell you, Jeremiah got disappointed. He was, he was through with it. Before we get to chapter 20 in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah said to God, I have, these people aren't listening to me. I've been mocked and ridiculed. I've been arrested and put in jail. People are throwing things at me. I'm hungry and I'm naked. And so this is what I'm going to do for you, God. I'm not going to mention your name anymore. But then he said, when I told God I wouldn't mention his name anymore, his word was like fire in my heart, like fire shut up in my bones. And I had to do what God called me to do. This is, this is Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah the prophet. He's lamenting. He, he is lamenting his people being exiled, his people being in captive. So when we get to the book of Lamentations, the entire book is a sad song. Chapter 3, when you begin to read chapter 3 from verses 1 to 20, it's all downhill. But because Jeremiah is connected to God, something happens in his heart in the middle of his cries. Y'all, y'all hear me. He has not been delivered from his trials. He's still up to his neck in pain and suffering. And while he's crying out to God, about all the things that are wrong, it looks like the Holy Ghost moved on his heart. And that's what's happening, isn't it? In the midst of our trials, when we don't see any way that it's going to end anytime soon, the Holy Ghost moves on the heart of God's people and helps them understand that even in the midst of your hard times, even in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your suffering, even when you can't see the end of the road, God is at work in your life. He's at work in your life. He's at work in your life. From verse 1 to verse 20 is nothing but sad song. But then suddenly in verse 21, something happens in the heart of the prophet. And he declares, even though I'm going through all of this, even though my beautiful city has been burned to the ground, even though the temple of the Lord has been ransacked and all of the valuables have been taken away and put in the temples of the gods of Babylon, even if I'm hungry and homeless and shoeless, yet, he says, I dare to have hope. When I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, says the prophet, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. And then he concludes, the Lord is good to those who depend on him, who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So let me tell you what you do in the middle of your trying. When, you, when the Holy Ghost moves upon your heart, 
to remember what God has done for you. Amen. 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 He has brought us. He's kept us. He has preserved us. He has provided for us. When our backs were against the wall, God brought us out. When we didn't know where our help was going to come from, God was our helper. Remember what God has done. Is there anybody here today that can remember what God has done in your life? And days gone by! The prophet says, I remember, he remembers. In trying times, in difficult situations, in hard days, we need to remember what God has already done. And then in the text, three things Jeremiah remembers that inspires him to hope in the midst of despair and helps him to know that even in the darkest time, God is faithful and will not cast his people off forever. It might feel like forever, but you're in God's hands. The first thing he says in verse 22 we need to remember that the faithful love of God never ends. Now, Now, God's love is not soupy and mushy like our love. God never stopped loving Israel even though he executes judgment upon them. Despite his disciplining of his people, He loves them. God's love is the greatest gift a human being can receive. It is the gift of love. And the problem with talking about God's love is we have a human tendency to compare it to our love. When we think about human love, most human relationships and most human relationships, the cases of love is selfish. And it's usually given out on the basis of the love of boldness of the recipient. Amen. We tend to love the lovely and the lovable. And we say, I love you, but we want to hear. Come on now. Some of us say, I love you, and then we wait. Because what we really want to hear is I love you back. When we give our love, we want something in return. When we give our love, we expect something in return. We want respect for our love, appreciation for our love. Amen. We want want to see some gratitude toward us for the love that we have given. We want loyalty for our love. We want affection for our love. When human being love, we always want something back. Amen. It has to be reciprocal. I love you as long as you love me. But if you don't love me, then I'll just love you with the love of Jesus. But God doesn't love like that. If you look at Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, God announces his love for Jeremiah to hear it. And this is what it says. Long ago, the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I have drawn you to myself. That's how God loves. In other words, God loves you. His love for you predates your arrival on planet Earth. Did y'all get that? God loved you before you got here. He knew you would be here. He loved you before. God loved you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. And you had no influence on God's decision to love you. He just loved you because he wanted to. He loves you because he loves you. And there is nothing you have done, nothing you are doing, and nothing you can do to make God love you any more or any less than he has always loved you. His love for you has always been all the love that he can give to an individual. When I'm depressed, I think about God's love. And his love never changes. 
I love change. We can stand before a preacher and say, I do, and I love you, baby. And six months later, we don't even want to speak to each other. Human love changes. My offspring can break in my house, ruin its life, her life, his life, and steal my TV, and I won't want to speak to him again because our love changes. God's love never changes. God's love for you, it never wavers. It never diminishes. And it never doubts. God loves you with all the love God has to give all the time, regardless of what you do. Lord, have mercy. He just loves you because he loves you. The most profound biblical theological statement in human history can be found in the words of a children's Sunday school song. Yes, Jesus loved me. Yes, Jesus loved me. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's all you need to know that God loves you. And you know how we are when we love somebody? We will give all that we have out of our love. If you and I would give all that we have out of our puny resources, how much more do you think your heavenly father will give to you out of all the resources of heaven when you are depressed? You need to remember the faithfulness of God's love. So whatever your trial, whatever your struggle this morning, whatever your challenge in life, you need to remember that God loves you. Remember that God loves you so. That's what John 3.16 said. God so loved. He didn't just love. God so loved. He so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved that he left heaven, put on a body of flesh, and came here to rescue you. God so loved that he chose you before he laid the foundations of the earth. God so loved that he preserved you until you can have till you came to your time of decision for Christ. And then God so loved you, he didn't leave it up to you. He moved in your heart and gave you the power to say yes. God has so loved you that he preserved your parents till they gave birth to you. And then he protected you all the days of your life. God so loved you that he put food on your table every day. God so loved you that he gave you a roof and a comfortable place to live in. God so loved you that he woke you up this morning and started you on your way. If you ever need a reason to rejoice, just remember the faithful love of God our Father. In the middle of his despair, in the middle of crying, in the middle of singing a blues song, Jeremiah remembers three things. The first thing he remembers is the faithful love of God. But then the text says in verse 22a and 23 that he remembers his mercies never cease and his mercies begin afresh every morning. Two things. Number one, his mercies endure. And number two, they're fresh every morning. You know the difference between grace and mercy, don't you? God is gracious, but he's also merciful. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. We were saved by grace, and that's a gift from God, not of works, so nobody can boast about being saved. Salvation is a gift from God. It's a grace gift from God. Mercy in the Bible is God withholding his punishment from those who deserve. In the text this morning that we're looking at, mercy is that which is extended to an offender in the form of forgiveness of sin. So while God is executing judgment, he is still merciful. The songwriter says he's not just merciful, but he's merciful and mighty. He has the power and the right to execute judgment, but he's a God of mercy. Mercy is God's preference. He delights in showing mercy. And we see that clearly in Psalm 51, when David sinned against God and Uriah by taking his wife 
and then having Uriah killed in great anguish and guilt with a heart of repentance, David cries out for mercy. If you hear him in Psalm 51, verse 1, he says to the Lord, have mercy on me, but he knows God. You can tell that he knows God because he says, have mercy on me, O God, and I want it according to your unfailing love. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your great compassion. Have mercy on me, O God, and blot out my transgressions. My brothers and sisters, the prerequisite for receiving God's mercy is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God is merciful. In other words, whatever your trial is right now, whatever your conditions might be right now, whatever your circumstances at present, know that God is not angry with you. And if you ask for mercy, he pours it out. God extends his mercy to his children who ask for mercy. Somebody needs to say amen right there. Mercy means that God does not treat us as our sins deserve. And a whole lot of us are glad about that. When we remember that God is merciful, I'm confident that God will not put on me more than I can bear. When I remember that God is merciful and I'm not all that I should be, I thank God for his mercy. Psalms 136 says we ought to praise God for his mercy. It says thanks unto the Lord for his mercy endures forever. My brothers and sisters, when I stand in the presence of God for prayer, I'm on grounds of mercy. Amen. Amen. I plead mercy when I'm in God's presence. I realize that God doesn't owe me anything. Amen. He doesn't owe me a thing. And so I want him to have mercy on me. I haven't earned God's favor and neither have you. The reason we experience the favor of God in our lives is because God is merciful. I don't want justice. What I want is God's mercy. I can't stand up under God's justice. I can't hang with God's justice. I am guilty if God executes justice. What I want from God and what you want from God is mercy. That's why everyone in the New Testament who received this healing began this way. I know I don't earn a healing. I know I don't deserve a healing. My life is messed up. My talk is messed up. My walk is messed up. My vision is messed up. God have mercy. Have mercy on me. God re responds to his cry for mercy. His mercy endures. It never runs out. God has all the mercy you need every day and more. His mercy endures, y'all. That's a verb. His mercy, his gr sin grieves the heart of God, but his mercy endures. It continues at the same rate. It remains firm and it abides forever. Our commitment to God's will and to God's word should always be uh, one thing, but it never is. But his mercy endures and it endures forever. And then mercies begin afresh each morning. Yes, yes, yes. Yesterday was Saturday. That comes as no surprise to you. All of us used all of the mercy that God had for us that day. When you went to bed, you were out of mercy. You used it all up. But when you woke up this morning, it's like, it's like, it's like the manna that fell on the ground in the wilderness. God told Israel, take enough for the day and it'll be sufficient for the day. But don't think that that's going to last till tomorrow. As a matter of fact, don't even put it away. Don't even save any. Because if you do, it's going to stink. But when you trust in God and you wake up in the morning, there'll be fresh manna on the ground. Hey, my brothers and sisters, thank God for his mercy. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Oh, 
I have needed. Thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, to me. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God his mercy endures forever. And thank God his mercies are fresh every morning. Jeremiah said in the midst of his depression, in the midst of his hard times, in the midst of the ashes of the city of Jerusalem, and while looking upon the walls that had been broken down, while seeing the temple desecrated and all of the values of the temple being taken and placed in the Babylonian God's temple, Jeremiah is singing a sad song and there's no end in sight. But in the midst of it all, the Holy Ghost moved on his heart. And he said, I will have hope when I remember this. The faithful love of God endures. That his mercies never cease. And his mercies are afresh every morning. And then third, the Lord is good to those who depend on him. Amen. The word good refers to the character of God in this text. The word reminds us that God not only does that which is best in the lives of his children, but he does all things well. The Bible says all things come together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so, my brothers and sisters, we can thank God for he is good and his love endures forever. And his faithfulness continues through all generations. That God is good and the source of all good things. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of life. Amen. And there is no shadow of turning with him. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. In good times, God is good. In hard times, God is good. He's good when he answers my prayer, yes, and he's good when he answers my prayer, no. God is good in every situation. Have I got a witness in here today? Has God been good to you? Let me tell you what he's done for us. God has been good to us all the days of our lives. God has saved us. God has kept us. God has delivered us. God has sustained us. As a matter of fact, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. He's good all the time, and all the time he's good. I don't know about you today, but I thank God for his goodness. I thank God for his grace, and I thank God for his mercy. Can God get some praise in here today? for his goodness. My brothers and sisters, God knows where you are. Yeah, he knows where you are. And he knows how long you have been there. And he knows the weight of your burden. And let me tell you this. The reason you walk in here today is because he is bearing that weight for you. He knows what you're going through. And I promise you, he will not forsake you. Amen. You may have a few more days or a few more months or a few more years to deal with your situation. But his grace is sufficient for you and punctuate your life by remembering that God is love. He's not going to put on you more than you can bear. Remember, he doesn't run out of mercy. And remember that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Come on, give God some praise. Would you please stand?